My name is Dustin. My name is Jessica. We are the Popcorn Poops. Here at Popcorn Poops HQ, we produce movie podcasts slash commentary tracks that may be synced up to whatever film we're talking about or enjoyed as a standalone audio program. For those of you syncing this recording up to a streaming or disc-based playback device, we recommend that you go ahead and begin the film and then immediately pause while the time code still reads zero. This is to minimize any syncing mistakes caused by those pesky loading or buffering times. Today, we'll be watching the 1988 film Beetlejuice, directed by Tim Burton. It's time to start the film. Sinkers, press play at the beep after the countdown. Ready? Three, two, one. And we're rolling. The first thing that we should see uh, as the film opens is the Geffen logo and the beginning of the main theme by Danny Elfman. And you should hear Danny Elfman's voice saying, Deo, he say Deo, uh, which is a line from a Harry Belafonte film that is featured later in the movie. In fact, there's there's quite a bit of, of Calypso music by Harry Belafonte in this music. Harry, 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 Harry Bel- Belafonte. Harry Belafonte. <laughs> song, song. S- song, yeah. You said, I, th- I thought you said film. In this film. Mm. There's quite a... There's quite a bit of Harry Belafonte music <laughs> in this film. We're off, off to a good start. We're off to a really good start. <laughs> um, I think, speaking of the music, I think that the music in this film is probably my favorite Danny Elfman score. Uh, it's certainly one of his earliest I, as far as I film don't story have a goes. favorite Danny Elfman score. They, they, they all... <laughs> They do kind of run together after a while, don't they? Mm. But this is before people started hating on him so much, which still makes me kind of sad. I think he's a really talented guy. I think this is his elfmanliest work, if we can make up a word. The the elfmanliest. The elfmanliest of his of his of, Elfman's. of his oeuvre. Um, we we come to learn that what we're looking at right now is actually a, a miniature model. Uh, but I don't know. It, this is probably the miniature model right now. I think some of the shots are actually a flyover, though, um, of an actual town. Um, but, yeah, I I listened to this soundtrack, the score, uh, too much, probably, in, in preparation for this. And it never really got old. I think the music is, is really, really good. And, obviously, that's... Uh, you know, that's uh, a compliment to, to Mr. Elfman and, and his work on this. I mean, I think I think his work is fine, but it's just very... It's not like I'm... I, I can't drive around listening to this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is like... It's like watching a cartoon. I might... It, it is uh, It is kind of... I, I liken his style to kind of like carnival music. It is. It, it feels like, like carnival music. Yeah. Um, I always think of him for the opening for The Simpsons. That's what I think of when I think of Danny Elfman. Yeah, that, that's that's really strange. I, I guess I always think of this and and his uh, and his scores for the Batman films. Um, so here we see Alec Baldwin, uh, who plays that's a good spider. Adam, I would not touch that spider. What that he just pulled off of that, that model house. Um. He's really great in this. I think the casting, which we'll get into a little bit later, I think the casting is, is basically perfect in this movie, and it, it wouldn't be the same. Not that any movie would be the same without the actors that end up getting the roles that they get, but uh, uh, I think that they couldn't have done much better than, than what they did. And and Alec Baldwin is, is, is really great. He plays um, Adam Maitland. And this is Gina Davis playing... Uh, Barbara Maitland, I believe her name is. And, uh, I mean, their, their relationship, number one, is probably one of my favorite things about the movie. Yeah, it's because it's so sincere. Yeah, absolutely. They've got... It's such a real relationship. They've got really, really good chemistry, I think. So... It's in the, it's in the writing, too, though. It's not just the the chemistry and the actors for me. It's very much... I mean, the fact that they have a vacation and that they're spending it together at the house. It's at just home. everything about that. Yeah, redecorating mm-hmm. and, and that stuff. Yeah. It's very. Doing a little home project. It's very real to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The way they interact is very real. They f- it really feels like they're in love. Yeah. And um, 
we we come to learn soon that uh, they're actually looking out the window right now because a character named Jane Jane Butterfield I think her name is um, she, I, I I guess she's a friend of of the family the, a friend of the mm-hmm. Maitlands when I was Real when I was a kid agent. I got I got the feeling that maybe she was related like she was family and yeah. I think she does say that their family they their family later on but I don't know exactly how she's related. Um, but she wants to sell the house. She's a, she's a real estate agent. And uh, she says here in this conversation that she doesn't think the, the house should be for a family that can't have kids, basically, that doesn't have any kids. And we, we come to learn that the Maitlands uh, probably are unable, or unable, rather, mm-hmm. of, of having children, which kind of hurts Barbara's feelings. And... Uh, I think that it's it it makes their relationship even more interesting and maybe even more real the fact that they can't have kids um and you still see like how in love they are and and even though they might want children it doesn't define their relationship they they do seem to be perfectly happy on their own um we this is actually another Harry Belafonte song that's playing right now the one playing on the radio in the background yeah uh in the first scene uh, in the attic, uh, a song called, I believe it's called uh, My Sweetheart from Venezuela, I think. Um, and then that song that was just playing that he just turned off was called uh, Man Smart, Woman Smarter. Ah, well, at least it has a good title. So. Well, it's not on the CD soundtrack, so it's not real. Mm. Uh, which is un- actually unfortunate. I think every soundtrack should have more Calypso music. Regardless of the if every soundtrack Schindler's List, That's a broad statement it is. It's very broad. Uh, I do love that Schindler's List. <laughs> I, do, I apologize. I do love their house. Their house is very. I think it is Victorian. I think it's a Victorian style. We had talked about this before. Victorian style. I I guess. I mean, I can see it if. To me, it just looks like, and maybe maybe this is because there are many Victorian style houses in New England, but it just looks like cliche New England house to me. Well, I think that's Victorian, though. Is, isn't isn't yeah. are, isn't New England kind of known for its Victorian? I guess so. I guess so. Um, do not want their car, though. It looks I, like I'm really surprised about that, actually, because pretty much it's if it's ugly, it's, you think I want it? Yeah, that's pretty much the way that I view your that's awful your uh, standard for cars. Is um, the uglier it is, the more you want it. This scene... It's a banana yellow uh, station wagon, Volvo I, station wagon. I mean, wagon. It's, it's super hideous. So, yeah. like, that just... That, do, that, that doesn't just speak classifies... Well, doesn't speak well of your opinion of me, <laughs> that I want to drive around a banana. And, no, it's just... It's, it's not my opinion of you. It's my opinion of your opinions. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of the car, um, in the screenplay, they actually put a lot of emphasis on a, a bumper sticker that is actually that makes it into the movie, but you can't really read it. Um, and they really put the emphasis up on it being on the car. You can kind of see it there before they go to the hardware store because the bumper sticker reads, uh, I break for animals or something like that, which foreshadows this moment right here where he... Uh, he breaks and breaks the for the dog. dog and crashes through the the side of the bridge, which is our inciting incident. Because right. um, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Beetlejuice, that, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say if you haven't seen Beetlejuice, then this kinda... is we're watching the Blu-ray, and this is probably the best shot of right here while the car is sinking into the water. Right, uh, probably get... the best shot of the of the bumper you... sticker. Um, but yeah, the inciting incident, and, and that is that our main characters are dead. They're ghosts. Uh, they come back to their house uh, in in this scene right here and start discovering that something is, is different about them. Um, and you'll you'll notice here that they are they are dripping wet, which we will come back to later in the film as um, as kind of a maybe maybe a missed opportunity. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a missed opportunity. In the rules of of this world, another thing we'll get into is the rules of this world and what they exa- what exactly they mean. I think the fireplace is kind of an important uh, piece of um, of of the set. It's kind for me. of the well, 
because it's sort of the the center point, your center, your po- your point of reference mm-hmm. for for the rest of the house. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case, and I think that uh, from a, a directorial standpoint, the spatial uh, awareness of the house, the blocking and the and the action and the movement within the house is really really well done, uh, especially the shot choices and, and the way the actors move through the spaces. You really get a feel for where everything is in the house. You never feel lost in the house. And uh, even later on, there's a scene when the Dietzes, the family that moves into the house, uh, they're kind of walking around and and marking off territory uh, to remodel. And you get a really good feeling for where everything is in the house. And I think that's um, uh, that's a that's a really uh, high point for this movie for me. I think is is a kind of spatial understanding of of the home of this kind of living space. So so we're here at um, my. One of my favorite uh, sets, all the horses on her, <laughs> <laughs> on the, the the mantle above her fire. How many but, horses is, is too many horses? Well, definitely the number she has. That's a lot of horses. It's, She's got at least like 10 up there or something. At least. I've never counted them. I've seen this movie so many times now. and Too, too many I'd, times. I probably should know how many horses are above that fireplace. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a a fun scene. Um, I think in this, in the screenplay, I like this scene because it ends with them at the window, seeing their funeral procession, Mm. uh, pass out outside. Um, but there's also a moment in the screenplay where in this scene where they fall through a mirror in the closet and end up in an alternate kind of, uh, purgatory. What this in, in the screenplay? In the screenplay, it's really, really strange. But are they? Y- they're you just saw like temporarily there. You saw Adam step outside the house, and he ends up on uh, what is in the screenplay referred to as the the moon of of Titan, right. uh, Saturn's moon of Titan, the sandy where sandworms live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but in the screenplay, there's a second kind of uh, purgatory. Uh, and it's it's like this black dark space where like these cogs and wheels are like flying around and Adam has to dodge out of the way. It's really really strange. Um, and I would have kind of liked to see it visualized in the huh. in the movie. But so this is Beetlejuice. We don't get to see his face yet, but we see that he's Francis and George Olson. Are those are those <laughs> real people? <laughs> those aren't. The... I hope not. Um, <laughs> um, not to say that there haven't there wasn't a Francis and George Olson at some point in history. Anytime I see newspapers uh, in a movie, I always do my best to look at the other articles to see if they spent like any, any effort whatsoever. Most of the time they do. I've done that myself. And it's, it seems that they do take the time to actually write uh, articles to, for the verisimilitude mm. of, of the newspaper. Um, so right now, I guess this is, when the 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 oh it's jane okay i thought it, i was like are we at the Dietzes moving in yet but no this is kind of a a reflection of of the funeral procession um a version of that i think you can see that they're in black clothes and they probably just come from the funeral right. or they're going to it so this is this is what made it into the into the movie from that part of the script yeah exactly i i like the 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 costumes a lot in this in this movie, uh, especially the the main two characters look look and feel really iconic to me in, in the clothes that they wear. Which it's surprising how how much they can stand out in this movie when when we're pairing them next to you know Lydia and her mom exactly. who have outrageous costumes every single scene, and yet still somehow um, the two main characters are memorable in their in their ridiculously mundane clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the fact that he wears uh, just a black and white kind of a uh, flannel shirt with the little red t-shirt underneath, just the red poking mm-hmm. out and her flowery. Is that a sundress? I don't even know if it's, I, I don't, I don't think that's, I, I mean, think not that I am the girl to ask about what types of clothes are, are exactly are what clothes, exactly but, is a sundress. Um, but I don't think that's a sundress. So this is uh, like lighter than that. These are the Dietzes. Uh, I love, I love how offended she is when he tries to kiss her. (laughs) Charles. Uh, 
Delia Dietz, played by Catherine O'Hara, who's just radiant and wonderful in everything she's ever done. Uh, even, uh, even Tall Tale. <laughs> Do you remember that movie? Tall Tale. She, I think she played Calamity Jane in, okay. a, in a scene. Uh, I have. I'm having like childhood flashbacks of some. Yeah. The, there was some Patrick Swayze and no. Oliver they're Platt. telling me the names of the actors. Like that's Doesn't gonna help. help. <laughs> no. We'll play a little game later. I'm gonna ask <laughs> no, you. Let's not. Let's I'm not ask play you if you any can name games. Any actors in this? No. Uh, and then of course we've got uh, Winona Ryder playing uh, playing Lydia Dietz, little little goth girl, little goth before I knew what goth was when I was a child. This yes. was. This was my first introduction to that, you know, kind of counter fashion. I think movement. for for most of our generation, for a lot of the kids, she was um, she was a big part of that. Certainly, unless you lived, unless you grew up in like New York City or Los Angeles or something, and you actually and you had like older siblings or something yeah. who were getting into it. Yeah, because goth goth really came into. It kind of started in like the late, late 70s, early 80s, and this film is from 1988, so it, t- it took it about 10 years or so to make it into a into a mainstream film, but then at that point, you know, then you, then you have Hot Topic, and, oh, right. and then you, uh, and that, that's it, you, and you, then, you capitalize on, on the goth movement, but that's, then, you know, that's fine. But I mean, like, I, I love her, though, I love her outrageous outfits, and I love her um, she's love- she's great. I mean, all the characters are great. We just we saw Otho, uh, Otho played by Glenn Shaddix, who's just she just great uh, in this. Uh, she licked his nose. She did. Did, did you? She's I don't a- think I've ever caught that before. Oh, oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's not much. I've seen this. But she too wouldn't. Many she times. was really offended when he tried to kiss her on the cheek, but she just it licked turns his around nose. And licks him on the nose. Yeah. Um. This is the scene I mentioned earlier when they're walking through the house, uh, kind of planning their remodeling, and uh, you really you really get a sense for the house, and it's uh, you realize like how well the house is laid out or how well the house is shot, rather, um, especially when we come back to the house about halfway through the film and everything's totally different, and you still know where everything is, and that's um, that's really cool. Um, Glenn Shaddix, though, he's wonderful in this as Otho. Uh, prob, prob, may, may be my favorite character in the movie. I, I really, so? I really, really love Otho. Um, I mean, I mean, he's awesome, but you know, he, uh, he died several years ago and at his funeral, uh, the last song that played was Deo, the banana boat song that's featured in this movie later it's really on. Sad, it actually. is, it is, but it's kind of, I mean, if you think about the song, it's kind of uplifting too. Like, I think it's, it's sad, but it's really sweet. I, yeah. I, no, no, I get it. I, I just, it's, it's sad it is, that he's though, dead. Right? It, I would say that. I don't know that I've seen him in anything else. I know that he was an actor in, in many things through the 80s. I'm not sure that I've seen another performance of his. Well, then, so is it to be assumed then that this was his biggest role or one, I of, think his, that's safe. one of his one of biggest, biggest I think it's safe to say it's probably his biggest. Uh, we haven't talked any, anything about Jeffrey Jones, uh, who plays Charles Dietz. Um, he unfortunately some some years ago was uh, arrested because he had child pornography uh. so that's that's really unfortunate he's he was in some some movies throughout the 80s uh, i think he's still working even today um but the other big thing that he was known for was playing the principal in uh, ferris bueller's day off okay he had a mustache in that and he, yes he ends up a mess by the end of the movie but uh it's it's unfortunate because I think he's a very very funny person and a good actor and I I, I like what I've seen of his work and it's it's and always, you just hate it when you find out that someone's looking at know, naked right? pictures of kids it's right ha- really it's really kind of hard. hard to like someone after that <laughs> it is it's tough and it's it's kind of hard to watch him in this and know that you know behind the performance is a man that uh, I just don't understand I, I can't understand I can't relate to right mm-hmm. um. So, messed up. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty messed up. Uh, we just kind of breeze past the scene, but uh, there is a little bit of gore in this movie. Uh, they 
when they went to the closet and she tried to scare them by pulling off her face and we get to see like a, a bloody skull and her eyeballs pop out and they walk into the library and, and she's cut off Adam's head. Yeah, and, and it's all that awesome 80s practical gore yeah, too, which, yeah, it's, is, it's, which, which is, is the best kind of gore. Of course it is. It's the best kind of everything. If it's Even if it's badly done, pra- oh, to yeah. me practical is, is usually better than CG. I'm just an, I'm just an old man like that. But... um. It is, it is kind of cheapy looking. <laughs> but there are some scenes I feel like they're dead makeup. Like like uh, the they do look a little bit pastier than other scenes. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit inconsistent. Uh, that scene in the, in the library, Barbara, uh, she looked like she had dark circles under her eyes. Like she yeah. was kind of made yeah, up like looked, a corpse. She looked sicker. Like, yeah, she looked sicker and, and yeah, very sickly. Um. But it's not like that in every every scene. I think in most scenes they look as alive as you know, as ever. Yeah, rosy cheeked. Um, so they're back on they're back on Titan now. You know. it, it, I think you've told me before that you're calling this Titan. Um, I'm I'm calling it Titan because they call it Titan in the screenplay later in the movie. Beetlejuice refers to this as Saturn, but I don't think you can actually step on Saturn. I think Saturn is. Yeah, it's all gas. I think right? it's a gas giant, isn't it? Isn't that what it's called? I don't know. I don't know space science so. <laughs> or any science. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not good at science. Uh, You're not good at knowing things, you know, that are like that have to do with like real life or right. If it has to do know, with movies or cartoons, right? Then, then, then I know you're good a couple to go, of things, but, um, but no. In the screenplay, they, actual they do refer knowledge. to that as uh, as Titan, and uh, you were supposed to be able to see. Saturn in the background, but I don't think we did. We saw a couple of planets or, you know, celestial bodies of some kind, but certainly nothing that looked like Saturn. I love this outfit that she has in this scene. Well, both of the women in this scene. So Lydia's fantastic veil that. As as they eat their. Right. And how is she eating also? I know she does put food into her mouth but she does, she's chewing at some point in this scene but she's got a black veil over her face and and it's pretty long we never see her sneak oh, the there, chopsticks no wait up, wait uh, i just saw it oh did you yeah here 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 she like, is she's sneaking her chopsticks up the veil yeah to take bites and then you know mom has these awesome gloves tied to her forehead long, like what are they called elbow gloves or long gloves or something like that Long gloves sounds good to me. Long, long gloves <laughs> tied around her head. Tied around her head. But this is another uh, another example of the the black. I, I I thought about mentioning it before. I don't think I did. But there's a lot of black and white mm. in this movie, especially in the costumes. Um, yeah, a lot of the characters. Adam, I mean, Beetlejuice is a, yeah. a most famous costume. Signature costume is black and white. The black and white stripes. Adam wears the black and white flannel. Uh, uh, Delia just had a black and white. Um, uh, top on in that scene. The house itself oh, is and black here, and here, white. In this, in this scene too, she's uh, she's got this yeah black, black and white and combination. White. Um, yeah, it's very it's very prominent. I, I think this the film actually understands um, what a color palette is, which I think is really really important for movies and and people don't. A lot of times people don't understand how important it is for making uh, the visuals of a movie memorable. Um, but I do think I, I, Bo Welch was the production designer on this. So he was basically in charge of uh, everything. He was in charge of hiring the art director and, and doing uh, you know the production design for the sets and everything like that. I think this is probably his, his best work. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think the one of the other things he did was the Men in Black movies, which I mm. is all as I remember the Men in Black movies also kind of have a black, black and, and white, white motif. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the headquarters and stuff, everything's pretty hospital inside, yeah, right? Sterile, sterile feeling, uh, and they of course they and wear black and white, white suits black and suits, everything. Yeah. So I think that that might be Bo Welch's thing uh, is the black and white thing, which is cool. Uh, I, I I like that a lot, and it works really well for this movie. And man, when Beetlejuice shows up in his signature outfit later on, it's yeah, he's it's sharp. Um, but I think I think it's not just the black and white though. Like there are there are a lot of different the, the people in this film were clearly very uh, very conscious of 
of the colors they were using in every scene. Um, we've talked before about the storefront. We didn't mention it this time, but at the very beginning when he goes to the store and he's he's buying some parts from the hardware shop and everything is red and white. Everything. Yeah. And it's just this... Like it's all, and, and I mean, what store has only red items in? The well, he front has of the he shop? has a red he has a red shirt on under his black and white too. So, you know that that might be tying the Another, store right. make, because it's his store. He owns it. It's it's the Maitland Hardware store. So, um, I love this moment here when she walks up to the car and and <laughs> and Jane and Jane's daughter Jane's daughter rolls up the window. She she gives her the uh, the skeleton key to the attic. And as Lydia walks away, Jane, uh, Jane gives her kind of a, a second glance, and just kind of shakes her head. <laughs> it's a pretty disappointed. It's a pretty good moment. There's some there's some good reaction <laughs> shots in this movie. Um, yeah. There's sort one later on when they meet up with Juno that I'll bring up. That's a uh, that's kind of a little bit meta, I think. Um, so as the as everyone's. Uh, starting the remodeling on the house Lydia comes up to the attic and tries to get in with the with the skeleton key and we're about to get our first look at Beetlejuice she's nesting in this scene she is she is putting wallpaper Barbara is. yeah Barbara is yeah absolutely up in the attic mm-hmm. so it's it, she's she's actually if you think about it she's doing what she was planning to do anything right. anyway with her vacation yeah doing the same thing she's redecorating and you know what and i just it just dawned on me there's a line in this movie where um the real estate agent that jane Mm -hmm. she says she makes a comment to the deets maybe deets yeah where she she says something about i decorated the whole house yeah yeah and and then she just just said it to lydia earlier oh so and then and then i just realized that you know the the whole point at the start of this movie is them redecorating the house. They're talking about, you know, getting rid of everything that maybe not getting rid of, but they're, they've got projects that they're working on, but yeah, that's, that's and it. then the, uh, the idea that the deets has come in and they redecorate the house. There's clearly something there. And, and then I'm, at the end of the movie, something that last time uh, we watched this, I realized is that at the end of the film, um, the house is not actually back to the way the Maitlands had it right, before. Right, it's like halfway. Half and half, yeah. And uh, I had never noticed that before until the last time we watched this uh, because we've had some technical difficulties <laughs> making this podcast. I believe this is the third time we've <laughs> we've recorded <laughs> and watched Beetlejuice. So we're kind of sick of Beetlejuice and, right now. And I know way more about this movie than... Than I should you ever wanted to. So this scene right here where they're drawing a door, you can actually see where they had previous takes and they've tried to erase the chalk off of the wall. I've never noticed that. Yeah. I just noticed it. Um, I have to ask though, did you, you did this as a child, right? Oh my gosh. Yes. Tried to draw, draw a door and go to the other side. Of course. Obviously. I mean, how could you not after after seeing this, like this, the two things that I always did as a child that were, um, if I had chalk and a place to do it, then I'd draw the door and, you know, you knock on it. And, and then the other thing I would do as a child, and, and I say as a child, as though I still don't do it, but if there's a wardrobe, you just, you have to feel all the way to the back. Oh, yeah, you course. have to. For Mr. Tumnus. Well, that's not why I'm trying to go to Narnia, actually. <laughs> this um, is the this is the first uh, first instance. This happens a couple of times in the movie, but the first instance of the uh, Stuart Gordon uh, reanimator green light. I just I, I whenever yeah, I see green so, lighting like so this, re-animator. I just it's so reanimator. Um, I think reanimator came out before this, so I'm going to just I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that it's a it's kind of a loose homage to the reanimator films or at least the first one. Cause I think the fr- only the first one is out at the time. I love that movie so much. Yeah. We, we should probably do that one. We should do reanimator for popcorn poops. I think that that would be no promises though. Don't, don't expect anything. Uh, so we can see in this scene where Charles is bird watching. Um, Lydia's about to run in and <laughs> see some really terrible. So I love see some <laughs> disgusting things. The bird eating like clearly some dead animal or something. He's just like, oh, 
<laughs> Lydia rushes in and, and tries to tell him that there are ghosts in the attic. And then we see Charles's path for the movie, his his kind of um They still have goal. there is there is a picture on his bookshelf of, of the Maitlands. Of the Maitlands in <laughs> I think in their wedding clothes. So he sees these buildings, he sees uh the good parking space and he gets an idea because he's a he's a real estate developer from New York City and the reason he's gotten away is because we get the impression that he had maybe, maybe a nervous he was forced to go yeah, away. Maybe he had a nervous breakdown or something like but that. But he was good it's clear that he was good at what good he at did. Him, yes. And they want his boss wants him to chill out and eventually get back in the game but mostly right now just wants him to chill out and of course he does exactly the opposite and how oh, here we go so we're in and the no exit sign too yeah we're in, back in reference to in the, the uh in the waiting room in reference to the play i, I think it's a one-act play yeah um about five people who remember how many are trapped in a room a and they time. discover that they've they just died um <clears throat> so they are in the af- afterlife what the, probably what the cartoon series of Beetlejuice would refer to as the Netherworld. Maybe this is 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 what the Netherworld from the cartoon was based on. But uh, you can one of the coolest things about this scene is that uh, waiting uh, or in the waiting room are, are various people who have died in various ways. And and we start to learn. We were going to mention the rules of this world, right. at least the rules of death in this world that. How, however you looked from however you died is how you stay, I guess, at least for a while, at least for a long while. Yeah. Um, so we, we saw a character with a chicken bone stuck in his throat and a, and a bib around his neck. That he obviously choked on a chicken bone while eating. A guy with a yeah, the shark bite. On shark his bite leg. on his leg. Yeah, the, the shark is still it's attached. The, yeah, like. Uh, I, I like the rattlesnake in the sleeping bag guy. Uh huh. Yeah, it's very cool. And we'll see some others when we get back to the scene. But the, right now, the guy, the guy who's run over with the car, I really like that one where he's. Oh yeah, that is that is cool. Um, but for the time being, we've come back to the attic where Lydia, uh, has broken in, and she's looking at the model, and she's going to find the handbook for the recently deceased or diseased, as as Adam. <laughs> mistakenly calls it um but when we get back to the the waiting room in the afterlife uh we get to see a a few other cool ones and then we realize that um actually much like the sixth sense uh when however you die that's how you're supposed to stay and then you realize that Adam and Barbara don't stay wet for the entire film, even yeah. though when they walk back in their house as ghosts, they are dripping wet. Yeah, they're dripping. And and I don't know, just some of the, some of the details about these other people, it's like, mm, it makes sense to me that they would be wet. It it does, but, but I can understand. obviously in the log- movie it doesn't. Right. I understand logistically. Logistically it doesn't To work keep out. your actors soaking wet constantly is probably not the most comfortable thing and then i love miss argentina of course and her her the slip my little accident which <laughs> we'll come back to later when another rule of this world is established and here's the guy here's the guy that got run over by a, a truck it looks like um and as they walk through the door, there will be an announcement uh, on the PA system. Oh, there's someone there. It looks like he has like open heart surgery. Yeah, died on the operating table. It looks like. And then see the skeletons in in the office. Though this is where it starts to get confusing to me because clearly they didn't look like that when they died. I mean, it, no one looks like like even the burn victim. He looks burned. You know, I so, have a feeling that peep that that the dead also die. I feel like they do deteriorate. They deteriorate in age, and that's maybe part of why Beetlejuice looks so so messed up is because like his hair is all crazy and everything. Maybe because yeah. he, um, he's, he's he's been older. around a long time because yeah. he, he talks about the Black Plague, living through the Black Plague. Yeah, so he he makes mention of that, and then we get this this scene here with the janitor, where the janitor says. Uh, the lost souls room is it's death for the dead. Yeah, it's right. It's right here. And we come to learn that you can die by being exorcised, but 
I get the feeling that they even put a time limit on how long they're in the house. Yeah, they. It's tell like 125 them how long. years. It's like you get 127 years, and three sessions with Juno is the kind of the throwaway line. This this janitor here, by the way, every time I see him, I feel like I. And you've never said anything about him whenever we watch this, but I, I don't always, think he's, I, don't I always, think he's well known, yeah. But I always he feel like though, he's right? one of those people that that you would be like, oh, this is a this is a cameo really by s- super famous. It's like when you know Stanley or something like pops in to say some some stupid line in right. every movie. Like it, it's, it, I get that feeling from him, I guess. So they're back in their house, and they're just now realizing that. And in one of these shots, uh, you'll you'll see the. The fireplace. There's the fireplace. Uh, and the time. The time has passed by. Time has passed. We've, it's we've been three jumped, months, we so. learn, from uh, this character, uh, from Juno, uh, who is played by a, awesome. a Golden Age actress by the name of Sylvia Sidney, who is probably most famous for being in Alfred Hitchcock's Sabotage. Uh, she unfortunately died of esophageal cancer. Which is... Not that surprising after you know, the way she's smoking these uh, these Cadillacs in this movie, but man, her, 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 her the effect with her smoke in this movie is it always has stayed with me since I was a kid. I remember this the way, so it looks like I guess she's she died maybe by having her throat slit. Who would who would like, slit the throat of an this old nice woman? Old lady, yeah, right? but. Well, we can assume maybe she wasn't a nice old lady. But anyway, uh, getting back to the just quickly the uh, the the fireplace, you're kind of reoriented now, and you right. See, you, we still know where we are. You see that the they've house. knocked down walls, but the the fireplace is in the same place, so you know that they're right in front of the stairs now, or they should be, and they're about to walk upstairs. And I think that's you know again um, a benefit to the movie is understanding where things are in the house. Um, but yeah, we, we don't see the special effect just yet, but the slit throat. Right, right. So yeah, the, the slit throat where she, it, and who knows why this old lady had her throat slit, but, um, the smoke comes out of, it looks, they make it look like it's coming right out of the hole in her throat, the slit. And it's great. It's fantastic. And how did you say you thought that they did it? It's think, under the shirt, maybe? Uh, it's coming out of her blouse, but I think the, the slit in her throat is actually post-production. I think. <sighs> That's surprising to me. This is, uh, I made mention of this earlier. She's going to... It s- looks like it's... Uh, yeah, it kind of does, It looks like it? it's coming, like maybe it's like a prosthetic yeah, or something, maybe. like there's a piece, I don't know. So the lighting changes and Adam and Barbara notice and look around, <laughs> a little She kind of looks down and she's like, what's, uh, going, what's going what? on? <laughs> she's telling this scary story and the lights yeah, I, I like. Uh, I like that moment. So Juno is explaining her history with Beetlejuice and that he... Uh, worked with her and thought that he could, you know, go break out on his own and uh, be a bio exorcist. You know, I just thought of something. She's not deteriorating. Did you think of that? No, no. What I thought of is we always, one of the things we always I just thought of that. <laughs> we've why I we've that. always thought, we've always talked about is why, why the hell is he in their little model? What is he doing there? Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> why? Yeah, yeah. Right? Like it doesn't make any sense. And she just said, He's been sleezing around your cemetery. And I know that when we when we see him, we see him in the cemetery in the model. Right. They have to dig him up. But but maybe that's not where he actually starts off. Maybe he actually maybe when she says that she means it literally that he's literally hanging around their graves and it's some kind of like. Like curse, or like some kind of connection or something, because he's he's literally. And haven't we decided before that the model home is like their portal to the outside world? It's, it was that in the screenplay. Uh, in the screenplay, there what, and it wasn't even very well defined, much like the rules of of the world in this movie. Uh, but in the screenplay, you did get a. a a feeling that that the model itself was kind of a portal for them to be able to get outside the house and go into the town um, for for whatever reason. They don't really use it, but it still I seems mean, maybe, to be the case. Maybe, maybe, though, it has something... Because she says he's been sleezing around your cemetery. Right. And immediately, in just the next shot that we see, we 
he is in the cemetery, but clearly in the model home cemetery because a little fly buzzes around. Right, right. right. But maybe, maybe it's still a portal to him. Maybe he's literally at their cemetery, like at their graves there, and and this is how he gets into their their little portion of spirit world because they aren't allowed to leave the house. They can't leave it. They're stuck here. Right. And maybe this is his way to get into their world. That's interesting. If uh, he goes through their grave. I, I don't know. I don't that, know. That, I'm, that's just, I'm trying to, to make it make sense because there's no reason why he's there in their model. No, there, there isn't any reason. And, it's, and, and it makes you wonder why the rules that have to apply to Adam and Barbara, why don't they, why apply, don't they apply to, to him? Beetlejuice? Why doesn't he have a home space? Now, I know like she, Ju- uh, Juno, I know yeah. she's, um, she works in the, in the afterlife yeah works world. for the afterlife works she's part of the bureaucracy that the afterlife is um now okay here's another thing too civil servants have we have we covered it hasn't that yet? come up yet uh, i was going to come back to it but yeah well, well, well let's talk about it anyways because i have an idea with her now is so they later later in the movie it's it's uh mentioned offhandedly that if you commit suicide in the afterlife uh, you become a civil servant, and we see that verified in Miss Argentina, because who has slit her wrist. Accident. Yeah, my little accident. She slit her wrist, and she's working reception in the afterlife waiting room. And we see other characters who seem to have committed suicide, like the guy hanging from the noose. That's you know, kind of the paper paper pusher kind of guy, uh, um, message giver. Juno's job, right? Is she a civil servant? I don't know. Does that I count? Mean, Did she clearly, slit her own right, throat? Right, right. And that, that, of course, that's... It's brutal. That's outrageous. That's brutal. If it's, <laughs> if it's true. But, but I mean... She has, she has a samurai? It's like, that's, I mean, wor- that's worse. That's almost worse than committing seppuku, I think. It's, it's right up there. But, yeah, I don't know. That, we're, we'll continue to come back to the rules of this world and continue to realize that they don't make sense. <laughs> just, I guess at this point, no though, we've, just, we've watched this movie so many times now that I am determined to, to make some sense out, out of no, this stuff. I, no, I understand. Um, I like this scene a lot here. Uh, they're out in the hallway, and, and um, Lydia has taken a bunch of Polaroids of them Polaroid. and realized... <laughs> Polaroids, yeah. Uh, it's a relic. Aren't they really expensive now? Yeah, I think um, they stopped making them. So anyone who still has like an old Polaroid camera that they want to use has to spend a fortune on eBay on on old unopened packs of film. But yeah, I like this. I like this scene a lot. I I don't. I'm not a fan of Winona Ryder generally, but I think she's great in this, and I think this is probably one of her best scenes in the movie, except for the suicide note. The suicide note scene is great. Weren't you telling me something before about some uh, major differences in the script? In the screenplay, there was an extra character. Uh, the, we're talking about Lydia now, right? Her sister? Yeah, Kathy. So the character of Kathy was Lydia's little sister. And she was actually given everything to do that Lydia does that's that's important in this movie. She was given the relationship with the Maitland. She's the one that can see them. Um, she's, she, you know, she is their connection to, to basically like they can't have a kid and uh, you know, Kathy kind of becomes their surrogate daughter, much like Lydia does in this. Uh, Lydia is in the screenplay, but she's totally unlikable. She's, she is the goth character, but she's kind of a jerk. She's not very nice to her, her parents, but the, then again, her parents aren't very nice to her and she's certainly not nice to her little sister. Um, but the, the, that's in the first draft in the screen of the screenplay, which is kind of a mess. I think, uh, it's got all sorts of problems. Beetlejuice is a very much, much, much different, uh, different character than he is in the, in the film. Um, I think he's described as a small Middle Eastern man <laughs> who transforms into a like a leather winged dragon of some type or demon. What? It's very strange. Um, maybe it wouldn't be so strange if that's the movie we ended up with, but I'm glad we didn't because it is. It's, it seems really out there. Uh, but that Beetlejuice actually in the original screenplay attempts to rape. Yeah, you've Lydia. told me that before, and that just some of the, some of the stuff you've told me from the original screenplay is is really 
it's really mind blowing that it actually evolved into this movie because it sounds like, like, I, I mean, the characters have such different relationships and yeah. So and this machine <laughs> doing as the what? screenplay says, a uh, complicated machine doing something unnecessary to the yard. <laughs> just, and I, I, I'm glad to see that that got translated. Multiple arms into just film digging well. and throwing the dirt nowhere. Delia, in the scene where she's preparing dinner in the kitchen, uh, makes mention of a, a art critic or someone who works for Art in America magazine who will be at the dinner tonight. And we, we do get to see that she, she kind that of... Was, is that a fridge? That sliding door sliding thing door. she it has? It like it. Maybe a, a, a produce cabinet of some kind. Uh, but at the end of the movie, we do see that, that Delia makes it into the Art in America magazine. So everyone gets a happy ending. Most, mostly. Mostly everyone gets a happy ending. Except for Beetlejuice. But, you know, what do you expect? And I, I, have, I haven't said anything yet. Mm. Surprisingly, but it's coming up, and I've got to. I mean, this is the scene they meet Beetlejuice in this scene, and I feel like now is as good a time of, as any um, to say that basically I don't think Beetlejuice belongs in this movie. I think that this would be a better movie without Beetlejuice in it, um, because I think the relationship with Lydia and the Maitlands is so good, and I think that the Dietzes as the unknowing antagonists to the Maitlands who are trying to keep their house and who are struggling with new people being in it, I think is much, much more interesting than this outlier that just comes in this crazy off the wall cartoon character who just comes in and kind of messes with stuff. Like he's, he's, uh, um, he's kind of a deus ex machina in a way. Like even though he is the conflict I, and not I the don't resolution, know if I'd go but that far though, but he's, he's not the resolution. He ends up being the conflict, but the Dude, movie treats the movie treats him as the resolution to a problem that it sees in its story that it needs a conflict. So he just jumps into the mix. I know, but they already have a conflict, though. Their conflict already is is the Dietzes. Like that's... exactly, exactly. So why do we need Beetlejuice? The De- the whole thing with the Dietzes is much more interesting than Beetlejuice. Like, yes, I love Michael Keaton. He does a great job in this movie playing Beetlejuice, but. Uh, it's, an, it's an extra layer. I don't think it's enough of a conflict. I disagree. I think that you could have made it into a, a into uh, a significant enough conflict. I mean, because it's it, it's already love, a significant love, enough as conflict. As they dig, seeing the different layers of the model, Foam of the model and cardboard home, yeah. and things, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, I just, but I love I love any of that stuff. Like, honey, I shrunk the kids. I get so excited when. When I watch that movie and and I get to see like oh this is what grass looks like really big and of course the oatmeal cream pie which is, is every the child's most delicious dream. looking thing in, in I mean in all I, of I still dream about it I still think to myself how someday you're gonna find a, how a giant oatmeal cream pie. like if you get one outrageous wish and it can't be anything useful then I would wish for a gigantic oatmeal cream pie mm-hmm. that I can just take handfuls of yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, <laughs> that's probably the best part of that movie, or at least the most delicious part. Anyways, I love... So this is Beetlejuice, played by Michael Keaton. He's uh, he's great. He's great in this. Man, I recently w- rewatched Batman, and it's kind of weird to watch Batman in this back-to-back, because he's, he's, he's totally different. Is he <laughs> He plays Batman? Bat- he plays, yes, he plays... You didn't know that. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, he does seem to be deteriorating, though, right? Uh, compared to other characters, and he talks about how he old does. he is. Later. Look at, I mean, it looks like there's mold on his face. How and do you think he died? Do you think he? I don't know. Do you think he drowned like the Maitlands? Because it looks like he's got some algae or mold. But or something but that on him. wouldn't be the way he died, though. If he's got algae on him, algae and stuff doesn't happen at the moment of death. No, but at, over time, right? If he's but old, I don't I, it, we, like if that's how he's deteriorating. Okay, so you're thinking that the way that the body actually deteriorates in real life, so like if they're buried in the ground, then it deteriorates the way it would there. Yeah, maybe. As I don't know. compared to being I have at the no bottom idea. of a lake. They, I have no idea. We're speculating no. on something that's not that's not explained at all, but maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. They challenge him. 
and ask if he can be scary, and he makes a jerk. He just he <laughs> just made the jerking off motion. Off motion. <laughs> it's great. Uh, and I was as a child when I watched this, I was super super disappointed that we didn't get to see the scary face. Right, he does that. And as an adult, I, I'm even more disappointed because I know that they actually made a super like complicated prosthetic for there was a front and to just that. decided that we maybe the we studio weren't. heads I think I heard the studio heads thought it was too scary for the movie um what what other movie did that recently ah it was one of the nightmare movies because so oh it was one of the deaths in, in it, a later it, nightmare no no film. no 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 it was one of I think it was the um ah uh, no okay it was the little girls that she tries to save from the house it's in the Fourth one, Dream Warriors is three. We just recently watched all, all of, of the Nightmare which was, movies, which is a mistake, and followed it with a with a four hour so documentary. If it's number four, it's got to be the Dream Master because the What's fifth it? one is the Dream Child. So I think I think it's number four. It's e- it's either number four or number five, and she's running into the house. And she sees a little girl and she's trying to save the little girl and she picks her up and is carrying her. And then the little girl turns into a corpse. Oh, uh, right. So I'm pretty sure in the documentary, the four hour. Never sleep hour again. It's a four hour documentary. exhaustive documentary on the entire <laughs> we watched. Nightmare franchise. Um, and that was over the course of like a week because we have lives and jobs and. It certainly wasn't in a night. Um, so. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the in the documentary they said that the the doll that they created a really terrifying yeah, that's right. it was too scary. And they didn't even put it in the movie because they were like, Oh, people are gonna be too scared. Yeah. Um so so ridiculous. It is it's pretty dumb. But uh, th- this is the the famous dinner scene. But before we get to this, uh we did we did miss uh, the famous uh F word. The, the f bomb that that uh, yeah. Beetlejuice dropped. He says, "Nice fucking model," and then grabs his oh, dick. Oh, and my favorite, my favorite <laughs> thing where he grabs. It's not just that he grabs his dick; it's that he grabs it and it honks does like, like a it's cartoon a, honk noise. Oh my god, it's so awful. Um, my my brother decided to co opt that line uh, in the church parking lot when oh, he was three years old. Stuck bet his head. Your mom really appreciated it. Yeah, stuck his head out of the sunroof of my mom's Honda Prelude and just <laughs> screamed. At the top of his three-year-old voice nice fucking model zero context no context at all and uh yeah i I don't think she good afternoon for both of you that's good i don't think we were allowed to watch beetlejuice for a while after that but well and this this scene is a good tie into your childhood with this movie too because this this scene is probably why you were allowed to watch this movie even it's my mother's favorite scene um, especially because Even of with the Otho, Otho's yes, uh, Otho's performance in particular is is good, and of course, what we're talking about is the dinner scene in which the Maitlands possess all of the dinner guests at the Dietz's dinner party, and they all dance to uh, the Banana Boat song by by Harry Belafonte. Makes it so that I can never again look at cold shrimp the same way. They look really good, though. <laughs> they're, they're really big. The only time I have ever seen shrimp that big is here. Um, here, here. I think in Australia they call those style shrimp prawns, or maybe they call all shrimp prawns in Australia. I'm here, sure. meaning I don't think we've mentioned it, but we um, we live in Japan. Oh yeah. So yeah, that's an important little detail. Not super important, but. But yeah, I see shrimp that big here when they do tempura and stuff. It usually is that jumbo shrimp. Mm-hmm. Jumbo shrimp size. Uh, but yeah, this is a uh, this is a wonderful scene, and the performances all around are just great. This kind of back and forth on the you can read it in their faces as they lip sync, uh, and you can see that they go from being really into it and dancing, like being taken over by the you know the spirit, you know, so, like, yeah. no pun intended. Like when he hits the moment, right here right with here, the with the Otho ice. Otho is drumming. He's way into he's it, like, and then he's oh, like, "What am I yeah, doing? What, What's what? going oh, on?" Yeah. Uh, but it's it's great. I mean, of course, this is the scene that her, people her shaking think her of. hips and stuff. But this is probably the most iconic scene from the the film. I would say, yeah. 
Uh, and it's probably the reason I was still allowed to watch this movie as a kid, even though it had the, your mom the dreaded so F word. Which twice. actually, this is a, twice, twice. Uh, the second one's kind of hidden, uh, but it does come up later. I'll point it out. Uh, it's hard to hear unless you're really, really listening for it because there's a lot of uh, audio yeah, if you turn commotion on the subtitles, going on. You'll see it. Oh yeah, yeah, it's in the subtitles. Which would mean that today it would not. It would be an R, right? This would be an R-rated movie today. This is PG. This is it's rated P- PG. This is rated PG. And even at the time, it was kind of famous for being. Uh, one of the only examples of a PG rated movie that got away with having the F word in it. So the fact that they actually got away with two F words in a PG movie uh, is, is kind of remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any possibility of that. There's no way that would happen today. Oh, you can't, you can get away with the word fuck one time in a PG-13 rated movie as long as it's in a non-sexual context. Oh, right, because that makes it totally, you know, So, like, if, 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 if I was to say, fuck you, bro, that's totally cool. But if mm-hmm. I was to say, I'd fuck you, bro, then... Right, then we've got a real issue you've here. You've got a problem. Yeah, exactly. Can't, <laughs> can't have any sex. Uh, can't was... insinuate that someone might ever have sex. Speaking of the, the the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the uh, Delia's agent, um, the one sitting across from the three women here, uh, is a, a TV talk show host from the 1970s named Dick Cavett. He has a very he had a very famous talk show in the 1970s, and he's actually in one of the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Uh, he he he's on. He does a bit on the Dick Cavett show where um, where Freddy Krueger shows up and kills him and the guest, and it's one of the girls. I think it might be in Dream Warriors. Maybe it's the girl that's like watches a lot of TV and smokes a lot and burns herself with the cigarettes. Maybe so you, I, I, it's it's it, it's might not be that one. It's either that one or the other. The other possibility. Maybe I thought of the dead. other. Yeah, Freddy's dead. That's the one I was thinking. That's the one that's the. The where all the characters it's like super meta, right? And all the characters are are making a movie. No, of that's making... no, that's 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 new nightmare. Uh, okay, well then it's new nightmare. Then that's the one I'm thinking of because remember Freddie, not Freddie, but the uh, the actor. I know what Robert you're thinking of. Goes... That's not the Dick Cavett show. Oh, okay, I have no idea. That that Dick was they, they actually is. did like a talk show in New Nightmare, but the one I'm thinking of is a character is watching uh, a a a talk show the on TV. The only time I remember that then is in Dream Warriors because she's the girl who wants to be an be actress who Warriors. smokes cigarettes, who stays awake by by putting the cigarettes out into her arm. Yeah. She gets killed in that awesome iconic scene where she gets her head pulled into the Welcome TV. Welcome to prime time, bitch. <laughs> right. And so and she's watching a talk show right before that happens. Mhm. And I think like Freddie appears probably, on it. If, or if something. that's what it is, then that's definitely it. That's the Dick Cavett. So, so there is there is another little tie in to uh, to the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Um, yeah. So they're they were discussing um, you know the ghosts, and they're actually kind of happy that they have ghosts because they feel like they can exploit them, and the Maitlands don't want to come down. So now they're coming up to the attic uh, to to confront them. Uh, and they're not, they're not in fact going to see them, but, uh, Otho is going to find the handbook, which will prove, prove problematic later on in the, in the movie. But, um, so this, I've been meaning to ask you, uh, what do you think about Tim Burton as a filmmaker in general? Like, I, I, and you've seen lots of Tim Burton movies, whether or not you know you mm-hmm. have. Yeah. What Tim Burton movies uh, have you seen? <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, I, every time I say Tim Burton movies, you tell me they aren't Tim Burton movies. Um, just name one and I'll tell you if it's mm, Tim Burton movie. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. He, okay. He did. He, he yes. It's a, it's technically a Henry Selleck film, but he did produce it and he wrote the story. So sure. It's, it's okay. Sure. So it is K- kind of, yeah, kind of. It's kind of it's he didn't direct. Isn't it, it really Tim Burton-y though? Is that am I not supposed to? <laughs> it's certainly Tim Burton e, I guess, and that it's kind of macabre, 
but uh, and <laughs> that's really funny. Uh, he, okay, the then ones, what, what else? Edwards has her hands. Ed, oh, okay, Edwards yeah. Edwards has her yeah. hands. Ed Wood, he did Batman, Batman Returns, I've actually Mars seen Attacks. Ed Wood too. You've seen Ed Wood? Yeah, Ed Wood's I've, I've, probably his masterpiece. It's great. It's that's that's about the guy who made that really really awful he made sci-fi a few movie, right? Really awful. Plan Nine from Outer Plan Space. Plan Nine from Outer Space. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I've seen that. I've seen Ed Wood. Um, um, what do you think about him though? Like, like for me, I I really like his early films. I think I think Ed Wood is. I, I, like I said, I think it's his, probably his masterpiece. Um, my favorite film of his is probably my, maybe Beetlejuice. It's probably a nostalgia thing. But what, I, what else? Or what comes after Beetlejuice? Um, I think his his first film was Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which Can't. is a good movie. <laughs> No, no judgment. I, I can judge if I want Pee-wee's to. Pee Wee's Big Adventure, then Beetlejuice, uh, Batman, Batman Returns. May, he got Edward Scissorhands maybe between Batman and Batman Returns, or maybe it was after Returns. I can't remember. Uh, Ed Wood, Mars Attacks, which... Where it's, oh, I remember that movie. Wasn't a fan. Uh, it kind of goes downhill from there. He did the most recent Alice in Wonderland. Oh, that, I think that's the last, right. That's what I was going to guess. The last movie of his that I liked was Big which Fish. I never, I never even sat through Alice in Wonderland. Um, yeah, it's And terrible. the thing is, is I actually am I'm a fan of retellings of that story. And I mean, I'm sitting th- currently. I am sitting through the oh, <laughs> Once Upon a Time, the Once in... Upon a Time in Wonderland no, spinoff no. of Once Upon a Time. And I mean, it's, the, the it's, podcast it's is derailed awful. too much if we're start if we're already talking about Once Upon a <laughs> but Time. But like, I'm even Wonderland sitting through that, and and I couldn't sit through the okay. Tim Let's... Burton Alice in Wonderland. So, do you generally do you like Tim Burton? I, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I think that. I kind of um, wish he. I, I kind of wish he would return to the, the creative stuff that the really creative stuff. But that he I used think to do. people. I think what's happened is people, like he's he's become almost uh, predictably creative or something like That's that. That's an interesting like, way to put it. Sure. Like we're like, oh, it's going to be Tim Burton, he, so people he, are going to look. He weird. He goes back to his own well. His work is derivative of his own work at this point, point. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think that's where people find a lot of problems, but I feel like s- story wise, he doesn't, I don't think he works with talented people. Um, like he should, maybe, maybe he just doesn't care anymore. Maybe he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, he, he's got to be super he's rich seen, now. He so. seems to be, uh, he, he is, he's one of the, the best paid, uh, directors in Hollywood. Right. So then, then, then it probably means that now most things are, are driven by the, the money and not by Mm -hmm. the art anymore that's unfortunate um but yeah even if he did something like you know big fish every once in a while i'd be happy with that i liked big fish um he did he did big fish yes that's that's out of the ballpark for me like that doesn't make any sense it doesn't make sense yeah um if you know he made it, it makes a little more sense, though. Like, I can see someone watching that movie and not being able to I see don't know. Tim Okay, Burton so in I it, remember, but... like, some weird stuff in there that I can kind of go back and think of. Aren't there two girls who are connected at. Siamese twins? Right? Is that. Is that, is that appropriate to is say? Is that politically are you correct? Allowed to say that? I don't think it is. Oops. I don't think so either. That's conjoined kind of... twins. Conjoined twins. <sighs> um. I, I'm pretty sure that there's some other stuff in that movie that that I guess I could think was Tim Burton. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, no. If you if you know, it's you can see some of the some of the Tim Burton isms, if you will. Uh, we totally missed the snake scene because we were talking about Tim Burton. The snake scene is kind of interesting uh, because they actually shot that before Michael Keaton had been cast. So the the snake doesn't actually resemble Michael Keaton at all. They just threw his voice in there. But after in my the fight. head, it always did resemble him. It just yeah. was like a poor. I, I think I think it resembles representation. I think it resembles what they wanted Beetlejuice to look like, and then they just made Michael Keaton look like that. Okay. Now you always say that the dancing scene, the dinner table, dinner party scene is was your mom's favorite and probably yeah. a lot of the reason why you watched this movie so much as a kid is because your mom liked it because of that scene. And sure. for me I wouldn't have seen this uh, unless my mom had liked this movie. So For me I think probably the reason why 
I saw it as a kid is because my I, I'm, I I think my mother enjoyed this movie too, but I remember my father really enjoying it mm. a lot and and he always just he just thought this stuff with the football players was the so funny. Thing. It just tickled his funny bone where he, he especially when they when they talk about coach where's the little boy's room for some reason he just thought that was hilarious. There's a really weird thing. We're going to come back to the the scene with Juno in the after uh, afterworld again, afterlife again. But um, there's this weird thing that apparently they tried to do. It's it's detailed in the in the script um, that the waiting room, the window behind the Maitlands in that scene has people that look. It kind of looks like they're sitting in an audience, like a the- movie theater audience, and it was supposed to supposed to create the illusion that the audience is watching the movie from one side of a two way kind of as, as though the movie's taking place in this median between, you know, the afterworld. You mean all those dead people sitting on the other side of the, of the window. And it was supposed to like represent people on the other side, like dead people watching the same movie that we're watching from the other side. So like if they're looking through the movie, they can see us on the other side. Like we can see them. Okay. Um, I don't think it doesn't come off that way. Like when I read that in the screenplay, I was like, oh, that's interesting. It doesn't, it I, but I've never questioned why they were there before. It's a, I just thought they were waiting to see Juno, I guess, or we're just waiting outside. Just, I, I don't know what I thought. I, I just thought they were just, Oh, we mentioned this props. scene earlier, the suicide note scene with Lydia. Oh yes. I love this where she, <laughs> Every time she writes a word that's not melodramatic enough or not intense she enough, she scribbles it out. Scribbles it out and writes something. Jumped, not, no, no, not no. jumped, not jumped. Plummeted, plummeted. having plummeted <laughs> off the river, river Winter Bridge. Winter River Bridge, rather. Winter River Bridge. Winter River is Winter a river is bridge. a fictional city in Connecticut. It's not real, but they they're supposed to live in Connecticut. They have, they do say that in the movie. Um. So this is where we get one of the cooler practical effects in the movie is their their monster forms. Mm, yeah. This her her specifically, her specifically. It's bothersome. It's a little bothersome. Yes. It that was the his doesn't really bother me where he like goofy. he pulls and he has like the long nose and like the bird thing on top of his head and then like all the eyeballs on his fingers. I mean, it's it's gruesome, but it it didn't really bother me. But hers did a little bit when I was a kid. Yeah, it's um the the transformation. Like as they do it, it's of course it's stop motion, which I have a flicks uh, at her eyeballs, soft place opens in my heart for. opens her mouth super wide, and then has all those teeth and her eyeballs sitting on her tongue. For some reason, it for some reason, I mean. For, for some the reason, obvious, for an obvious reason, reason, it bothered me as a kid, and it stuck with me. I think it's not just the way it looks, though. I think it's the fact that she is the more that she's the mother character. Mm. She's she's the one who wants to take care of Lydia, and and she winds up scaring her, and and I guess all of that, like it just culminated in my head as a kid, like. Yeah. Uh, this is a this is actually the scene where we where we get the second f word, um, and I, I I actually think this scene is surprisingly charming, uh, despite the fact that Beetlejuice is a lech, like a total just degenerate. Like the, well, he's, he's sitting in his location in a, a whore right whore now is yeah, in the whorehouse that he created. That he created. Um, which brings up more questions of like, what is he capable of? Well, yeah, what can he do? Why and why can he if do he the can things he can do? He can just make a whorehouse and and the lovely ladies who work in the whorehouse mm-hmm. out of thin air. Then what else can he do? Um, and why can he do those things? Right. Exactly. Uh, I do like this scene though. I think it's um. I think it's kind of charming. I think their 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 back and forth is is kind of charming, but they do they play a scene they play a, a game of charades where he tries to get her to say his name, because they're again, one of the main conceits of this movie is that if you say his name three times as he's talking about right now, uh, it 
releases him, it makes him, gives him power or does something. I'm not exactly sure because, again, what, what is he locked in? What is his curse? Why, why do you have to say his name three times? What does that, like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Is he trapped inside the model? I thought he was in the model of his own volition. Is he not? I don't know. Because the reason he he was able to transform into a snake before is that Barbara said his name three times, which brought them into the model with him, but it also unlocked his power, I guess. And then he turned into the snake. She said his name three times again, and it put him back in the model. And it's just, it's so weird because the the details of of the rules and stuff are, are totally, I buy all of it. It makes sense to me. Names have power in sure. mythology. Names have always had power. Yeah. So... So making that the thing where you say his name three times, okay, and the number three is one of many various numbers over various cultures, which which has a lot of power. So mm-hmm. so all all of this stuff, the details are very fine tuned. They're they make sense, but the broad reasons aren't there. I don't understand why he's cursed or or why he can do any of this stuff. Why? Can we can we assume that Juno can do all of these things? That she can make a whorehouse out of thin air? We know that she can disappear on command. That's the only thing that True. we see her do. And apparently she can summon them. She can summon Adam and Barbara to her at any moment. Because she just did that. Maybe all ghosts are capable of this kind of stuff. If Adam and Barbara older, are able to... The older to... you are, the more you can like train your power or something like that. I don't know. None of this is in the screenplay, and it has nothing to do with the the themes of the movie or anything. But it kind of like once you watch this enough times, you're like, why why don't we get this information? Because it doesn't make sense. We just missed the the f word. But as they walk in and interrupt Lydia saying Beetlejuice a third time, uh, he says, "Fuck you." <laughs> if you turn on the subtitles, it and does come up though. Falls off and, of the balcony. Yeah, exactly. Um, I like that. I like how they talk her down from, uh, from suicide. I know, I know that the, the suicide note scene is kind of played for laughs. So like there's, there's not a whole lot of drama behind it. And I think that was the right way to go. But I do like that, you know, she's being talked out of, out of death by dead people. Yeah. Who are saying, you know, we're life is just, you know, death is just as complicated as life, yeah. And uh, it's not, it's not worth it. it I, I like that. I mean, because they do through these scenes, through scenes like this, they do kind of become surrogate parents for her, yeah. uh, which they're supposed to. Like it, it, it represents their needs as characters and her needs as a as a child who might not be getting the the rearing that she really deserves uh she obviously comes from a broken we're, family we're saying her... might not and then we're we're talking about these people of, yeah uh, definitely she's not there's no way as likable as they are and in that's one thing another thing about the screenplay is that even in the second draft that this movie more closely resembles um the deetses weren't likable they're they're kind of mean they are Although they're unknowing antagonists, they do act like antagonists, but I think that the actors bring a lot of personality and a lot of um, uh, amicability to to these characters that is, is not really in the screenplay, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a big compliment. That's laudable uh, for the actors to be able to do that because um, they all give really, really great performances. And I like the Dietzes. I mean, yeah, they're kind of they're kind of jerks and they're kind of they're kind of hipsters. <laughs> hipsters, <laughs> yeah, like you know, artsy artsy New York people. They're 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 lampooning like the the artsy New York kind of uh, attitude that you know everything is art kind of thing. You know, well, they make fun of Lydia or right. the, of Delia's art. You yeah, know. because it's you know clearly clearly created by someone who. Doesn't understand doesn't, art, maybe. Right. We we aren't talking about it, and it has to be pointed out. The wonderful things on his map of the 
<laughs> the, <laughs> of the town that he wants to to develop. He wants to buy out the town and make it in a, like a tourist attraction. But the kind of things on the map are like Thanksgiving Park and the insect <laughs> zoo and insect zoo. Like half the map is parking, so people can go to the <laughs> insect because zoo because there's going to be a massive demand for Thanksgiving Park. Thanksgiving Park. I, like are we to assume that that is isn't there something like that in that's the holiday world right holiday world has like all the different <laughs> has a bunch of different part you can go to like christmas land and well okay christmas land. christmas land i'm is that I, what we can assume is is thanksgiving that thing, park? that's what i'm asking is thanksgiving park like a place where there's just a bunch of turkeys and everyone's dressed up like pilgrims and... <laughs> man i don't know um I like the, the the exorcism scene is pretty cool, um, because Otho is a character who throughout the entire movie is entirely in control of his persona, of how people see him, and of any situation that he's in. He acts as though he is the smartest person in any room, um, and when this gets out of control, he gets scared. And he doesn't know what to do, and I like I like to see that in his character. I think it's uh, it's pretty cool. But the little poem that he says, the incantation, if you will, I don't know if you've ever listened to it. It doesn't. It it's nonsense. Of course it. What, of course this it's one right now. The yeah. stuff he's still saying. Yeah. Drives us under man's delight. Drives us under man's delight. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's lots of it is just just nonsense. But um it sounds like magic words. So mm. It's close enough. Uh we didn't point it out earlier, but they did find their their wedding clothes in the closet when they were walking through the house and uh and planning the uh the uh redecorating, the remodeling. And that's what they're using to summon them right now is their personal personal effects is the is the wedding clothes. So as they are summoned, of course, uh, Adam and Barbara are in their wedding clothes and uh, they, uh, you know, quite quite symbolically, they grow old together as a couple, like right there in front of we. And everyone. this brings me back to something that always plagues me about this movie, too, where they're confined to the house part of part of the the rules or the the curse or whatever the curse whatever with death in in this world is that you're going to be stuck in the place you live i guess it's not the place you died right so so the place you lived is where you're going to be trapped for whatever that period of time is a hundred years or whatever it is um and i guess you're going to be trapped with whoever died with, with you? you or whoever was living in the house with you at the, I I don't I don't know but it, it makes me a little uncomfortable because because granted in this situation we have a couple that loved very each much other. so yeah. loved each other that that they would want to be together sure. when they died um but what if they weren't that couple what if what if they hated each other <laughs> <laughs> like Oh, what? he's in the suit. There's sorry to cut you off, but yeah, yeah I think that's valid. Um, here's Beetlejuice in his in his signature black and white striped suit, and he looks he looks pretty sharp. I mean, th- this suit. I always there have been times where, uh, well, th- before before we watched this um, about seven thousand times in the past <laughs> few weeks. Feels that way. Uh, before that. I I would have sworn that this was the only suit that he wore through the whole movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it's the only thing I I remember him for is in this striped suit. Uh it is certainly the most memorable. We haven't talked about the cartoon series much at all, but um I love this moment though when she says his name, dusts off the suit. He says it's showtime and the lightning cracks. It's great. Chills. It gives me chills every time. It's awesome. Uh, but yeah, he wears the striped suit in the in the cartoon. As he comes out of the model here, uh, on top of the hat that he's wearing, you can actually see the the head of Jack Skellington, 
uh, five years before the Nightmare Before Christmas came out. Um, and so I guess that was an idea already. Already brewing, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they were working on it yet. I know it took them a long time to make that movie because of the stop motion animation. Yeah. But I don't. I guess they were planning it at this point. Um, this is something that I I love the little the little creatures on on his carousel yeah. hat. Uh, but one thing that bothers me about this scene is the the two important people that he seems <laughs> to kill. I think they die. I mean, I think this is the real world now, and right, and, and he's, he so is he, acting he's as blowing a bio up the big exorcist. hammer arms, and he's going and to do the hammer game. What what is it called? The bell hammer strength uh, yeah, test. The strength test thing at carnivals, and he sends and them. He sends them through, through the, the roof. Yeah. They're dead through the ceiling. Yeah, through the, the ceiling. And I mean, if this is if this is real real world, like they've got to be dead. Everybody in this movie smokes Cadillacs. Everybody. And you know, these days, if anybody smokes in a movie, it's automatically a PG-13. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, fucks aside, the smoking <laughs> would, would have made this at least a PG-13 if it came That's out today. Crazy. Uh, what <laughs> When I was a kid, what he does to Otho here where he rips off his clothes and he's got a different clothes underneath. When I was a kid, I had no idea what the joke was. But it's apparent, apparently what he's wearing is tacky. And Otho would never wear anything tacky. Yeah, I never picked up on that as a kid. Yeah. Probably didn't pick up on it as an adult either. Unless I had said something just yeah. now. <laughs> so uh, they're about to to get married or they're going to start the wedding ceremony because again, more rules that don't really make sense. Um, He's going to be yeah. able to get out of his curse. If get out of something, he, he says, I want out and to get out, I've got to get married. So I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means at all. Get <laughs> out of what does he, will he come back alive? Will he not be, Cur- cur- what is his curse? I, I, don't, I don't even know. understand. I don't know. We don't understand anything about him. Again, this movie would be better without the title character. I'm, oh. I keep. I'm just saying, it would be a lot. It would make a D- lot more sense then, and would be. A, I don't know. But okay, would it be better without without the title character, or would it be better if they just gave us more backstory for him instead? Gave us more of our. I think of our Beetlejuice. Did, if you're going to do a movie about Beetlejuice. I think that it, he should be the focus of the movie. Where and he's not in this movie. Well, you how how much is he in the movie? It's only a very short no, amount of he's time, in the right? Movie. The movie is ninety two minutes long, and Beetlejuice is only in the film for seventeen and a half oh, that minutes. Is so crazy! Because in my it's like, mind, it's like I Hannibal think Lecter of, in the Silence of the Lambs. He was only in that movie oh, for I love, sixteen. Minutes. I love the the uh, little uh, priest guy. Yeah, the with the huge eyes. Yeah, huge. Eyeless um, eye sockets. So Lydia's wearing a red dress. There's an old wives' tale uh, associated with different colored dresses in a wedding. Married in red, you'd be better off dead is oh, okay. uh, how it goes. So, so that kind of makes sense. The others supposedly are married in white, you have chosen right. Married in gray, you will go far away. Married in black, you will wish yourself back. Married in green, ashamed to be seen. Married in blue, you will always be true. Married in pearl, you will live in a whirl. Mm-hmm. Married in yellow, ashamed uh-huh. of your fellow. Married in brown, you will live in the town. Married in pink, your spirit will sink. I don't know about some, that. Some, some of, of those sound, sound pretty made up by the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I've heard I've heard some of them before. But I think that that it also you know this kind of uh this kind of reference only works for western audiences because in Oh, we're in about Asia, to get uh Gina Davis with zipper lips. Oh, it's bothersome. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, oh, it's the terrible. zipper the zipper lips are really bothersome. <laughs> the zipper lips are But I'm me. pretty sure I'm pretty sure in at least in China specifically, uh I'm pretty sure that red is the usual color is for it? wedding dresses. I didn't I don't know anything about that. I, I had a student once who he he was always traveling to China and 
and I, I think he told me that red is there. Not that Google couldn't just so, tell me if I right. picked up my phone, but so Beetlejuice has the power to send people to, uh, to Saturn to the Sandworm place. And he also has the power to send people into the model and make them tiny. I love this little touch right here. He pulls the wedding, <laughs> he pulls the wedding ring off, off of, of some somebody's. disembodied finger. <laughs> That's great. Who he makes us believe was a former fiance or wife. He says she meant nothing to me, but that's that's probably just a joke. Um, we did not mention. Uh, so Barbara, Barbara comes through the roof on riding the sandworm. How and, did she tame it? Uh, ghost magic. Oh, okay, got it. Just you know, run of the mill ghost magic. Um, we totally missed it, but uh, the fact that Delia was uh, trapped by her her sculpture was foreshadowed earlier yes, in the movie when she yes, was trapped against that, the house and when they're moving the stuff in says, and she gets this is my art and it is dangerous do you think i want to die like this i'm shocked this town has enough girls to necessitate an entire school yeah that's that's kind of that's kind and, of surprising and and i hope that there's an all boys school because otherwise the boys aren't being educated in this town so <laughs> yeah so this is uh, the, the final scene of the movie, and you can see that the house is looks like it's mostly back to the way it was before the Dietz has moved in. But you can see, oh, I think I see, oh, they're in the process. That's what it is. It's not half and half. They're in the process of making it. Oh, okay. Of making it because back. see, you can see like you, the, the wallpaper stairs, yeah, is... on the stairs. You can see the wallpaper, and this is, is the wallpaper half. she was hanging up in the attic. Mm-hmm. She was she was putting it up against the wall in the attic. Yep. So, um, man, that's that's going to be an expensive, and you can see behind him the gray. Uh, that's going to be an expensive remodeling job for dead people who can't work. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I I guess we can assume that the Dietzes are paying for the dead people to mm. make their house back the way they w- wanted it or the way it was before. I don't know. The fact that Adam that 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 Lydia's reward for getting good grades is to be possessed by her uh, ghostly foster parents is. A little bothersome to me. I don't think so. It's I a think little it's, bothersome. I think it's fantastic. Oh, uh, here's the scene where we see Art in, art in America. America. Yeah. So she got her so terrible got, art into a magazine. She got into a magazine. That's awful. So this is for the, the rest of us. This is the fourth Harry Belafonte film, or fourth Harry Belafonte song featured in the film. This is "Shake Sonora" or or "Jump in the Line." I think it's also called "Jump in the Line." parentheses shake sonora <laughs> close parentheses <laughs> uh the cd soundtrack only has two of the four songs that are in the movie though and that makes me really sad like i said before did, haven't you told me did we already talk film, about the that there was supposed to be someone else who was doing the music for this the ink spots yeah the ink spots were the in actually in the last draft of the script it it still says that the ink spot uh, there's an ink spot song that plays it was supposed to be an ink spot song in the opening scene it was supposed to be an ink spot song in the the and famous who, dinner scene they're like a really old band really right? really old pop group from like the thirties i think wow. and their music one of their songs was featured in uh the video game fallout three the song i don't want to set the world on fire oh yeah i I remember it from the trailers. And uh, it it may have worked, but like I mean like like I said, I think that the Calypso music in this movie is it has so much personality. I think it makes this gives this movie uh a really distinct identity, and I can't imagine this movie without without the Harry Belafonte like Calypso style music. The way it contrasts with like kind of the comedic um, and Comedic, but kind of gross, uh, morbid, death-related humor. Well, and it brings it it brings it back to being a, a that that it's a that it's a comedy too. Like right. it's a it's a satire in some ways of. Um, so what? I, before I forget it, the how does the head 
Trinker die? The, I don't know. The, the guy who's The witch head, doctor. Uh, right. I think he's a... I, I can assume he's sure. a shaman or a witch doctor or something. Well, I mean, obviously the first guy dies because his head is little size now. He, <laughs> yeah, he, he died. Yes. I don't think you can function on a, on a, on a, head on that a size. little size head. But he, he, the, the guy that already had the shrunken head seemed to be some kind of explorer or... Uh, right, right. He's got like somebody who pissed off the witch doctor. Right, right. But how did the other guy die? I don't know. I don't know. He he was a new addition to the uh, to the waiting room. He wasn't there before. Right. So. Ah, uh, so maybe maybe one of the explorers. Yeah. Buddies came and got him. Got a little bit of a uh, uh, trivia here. Um, the studio didn't like the title Beetlejuice, and they wanted to name the movie House Ghosts instead. Ah. Uh. Uh as like a play on words like house guests. Uh, oh, um, sure. And then as a joke, Tim Burton apparently suggested the name scared sheetless and mm. was real upset when the studio was like, Oh, I like it. Oh, I like it. Good. That's good. It's good stuff. Good. good job. It's like not nah, Beetlejuice. Um, do you know, do you know where the star Beetlejuice is? Cause actually the title of the film is spelled phonetically like a beetle, like the bug and juice, like the drink. Uh, but the, the character Beetlejuice that his name is spelled like the star. Do you know where the star is? Uh, of course not. It's in the Orion constellation. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the shoulders. Um, Tim Burton originally wanted Sammy Davis Jr. to play Beetlejuice. I can't. I can't imagine that. But That's that doesn't make any sense in my head. It doesn't. Uh, although Catherine O'Hara was a replacement for Angelica Houston as Delia, which is interesting because I could see Angelica Houston playing that. No I'm, idea who that is. I'm. Um, she played Morticia in the Adams Family oh, movies. Oh, okay. Um, I had a bunch of the toys for this movie. There was a big toy line that was released where they just did every variation on every character imaginable. There was even a, a Beetlejuice in his burgundy uh, wedding tuxedo that had a removable head with a, the, the shrunken head underneath. Super unnecessary. Super unnecessary. I had so many of those figures. Um, so, yeah, I, that's probably going to bring us close to the end of uh end of this first episode this inaugural episode of the popcorn poops podcast uh it is our hope that uh you're able to enjoy this without syncing it up to the film but if you want to sync it up to the film by all means uh that's that's kind of going to be our our, our mo from now on um you can find us on the internet at uh popcornpoops.blogspot.com. You can also find us on the iTunes podcast store, the iTunes music store uh, where the podcasts are. Uh, please subscribe to us on there. Leave us a review, uh, especially if you like us, leave us a good review. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at popcorn poops, or you can find us individually. Uh, I'm under the name dusty cram cram. And, and I'm Jesse Casper Casper with a K. So uh, you can find us on there. Feel free to tweet at us. Any suggestions, any movies that you would like to see us cover. And, uh, and that will bring us to the end of this episode. So we will catch everybody next time. We are the Popcorn Poops.